Hello, NaNoWriMo. I am Grant Faulkner, Executive Director of National Novel Writing Month. And thank you so much for joining us today for this fantastic uh, webcast with, with Jack Gantos. And um, this morning I woke up, I, I start to lose track of days in October. It's so busy getting ready for NaNoWriMo. And I woke up and looked at the calendar and it's October 20th, which means two things. One, this happens to be the National Day on Writing. And one way to celebrate that is to, to tweet why you write to the hashtag why I write. And the reason I mention that is that sometimes I, I think the reasons we write, well, once we recognize those and reflect on them, they will help fuel our, no our novel writing. So it's a great way to get ready for National Novel Writing Month. And the second thing I realized when I look at the calendar is that NaNoWriMo is 11 days away. It is approaching really fast. And I was on social media and I read a few, few questions from people um, or concerns. One person said, I don't have a novel idea. Is it too late? Another person said, I don't have time to outline before November. Another person said, I don't know how to write a novel. So we're gonna answer those questions in this webcast, but I just wanna say, uh, it's not too late to, to get a novel idea. I actually haven't announced my novel yet. I'm still deciding but I have the goal of today. Today is my deadline to figure out what I'm writing in November because I do want those next 10 or 11 days to start thinking about what I'm gonna write and let it marinate in my mind. Um, and per the other concern, I don't know how to write a novel. You know what I think? The best way to learn to write a novel is to sit down and write one. And 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 beyond that though, uh, it's great to listen to, to masters of the craft like Jack Gantos, so we're so, pleased to have him with us here today. And he wrote this fantastic new book of writing tips called Writing Radar that he will tell you more about. But I'm gonna give a brief intro for those of you who don't know who Jack is. He's a, he's a marvelous writer. He has written books for readers of all ages from picture books and middle grade fiction novels to novels for young adults and adults. His works include Hole in My Life, a memoir that won the Michael L. Prince and Robert F. Seibert Awards. Joey Pigza Swallowed the Key, a National Book Award finalist. Joey Pigza Loses Control, a Newbery Honor book. This Joey Pigza, he's, a, he's definitely a compelling character. And Dead End in Norvelt, the 2012 Newbery Medal winner and the Scott O'Dell Award winner for Best Historical Fiction. And now he just wrote Writing Radar, which is a funny and practical writing guide uh, written for kids, but, but I think it can, it can apply for everyone, all ages. So welcome, Jack. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure yeah. to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to dig into some questions. And you know, we crowdsourced uh, a lot of questions. We have we have many, many questions, and I'm going to read some of those uh, from from our, from kid, kids, mainly in our Young Writers Program, and then we will open it up for questions from the whole community later on in this webcast. So so get your questions ready and put them in the chat window. So to start off, Jack. Mm -hmm. When did you first know you wanted to be a writer? This question comes from Paris at St. Peter Catholic High School in Canada. It's a, a bit of a difficult question uh, to answer, but, I, but I, I think I was sort of edging into that or, or you know, getting some sort of cognition of that when I would read a book very thoroughly and then the book would sort of rest within me, stay in my head. I'd carry it around with me all day. And uh, I would find myself entering the book. And I, I just found that, uh, that I knew there was something bookish, but what was unsatisfying was just having that book. I wanted my own book. So uh, to that end, then I started to think about how to write a book. And then I read my sister's diary, and then I, I, I understood how to write a book immediately because the diary was so boring that I thought, just do the opposite and it will be brilliant. <laughs> That's funny. How old were you when you decided to be a writer or recognize this in yourself? Um, I started uh, keeping a journal fifth, sixth grade, mm -hmm. but, uh, but that really didn't uh, signify that I was going to be a writer. I was not walking around saying, I'm going to be a writer. The, no teacher ever pointed to me in the class and said, class, Jack is going to be a writer, judging by his essays. Yeah, no, I love that. No one, no one ever singled me out either and said, "You are going to be the writer in the class. You're going to write the masterpiece." So no. it's good to know you don't have to be recognized early on to become a writer. 
Yeah, so I went to a Catholic school, and I think basically writers, you know, the hand of God went out, touched a writer on the head, said, you will be a writer. And they went, oh, okay, you know, I guess yeah. I'll get a pen. Well, that's great, because that's, that's our premise. We believe that everyone has a story to tell and that everyone should write it with us in November. So that's empowering to hear you say that. Well, uh, I, mean, I think it's true. Yeah, absolutely, I do too. Uh, the title of your book is Writing Radar, and I'm, I'm wondering what that refers to. Writing radar, uh, as a just you know, as a, a two-word phrase, uh, just refers to that 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 sense that as you go through life, as you go through through your day, really, um, you've got this kind of radar that is looking for uh, great-looking characters, interesting snippets of dialogue, uh, terrific action. Uh, you're you're also simultaneously reading your inside life. Like if somebody says something, what do you feel? What do you think? How do you answer it? If you see something interesting, what does what kind of sensation do you get? And so that radar is just like this this constant pulse which is taking place with you looking and receiving simultaneously. So that you have an exterior world and an interior world that you're capturing, and that becomes really the the major stuff of of writing. Yeah, that's that's so great. I always say that writers need to be attuned to themselves in the interiority of themselves and also the larger world around them. Yes. So the writing doesn't only happen when you're in front of the laptop. It's about kind of how you live your life. Oh, I think so. I think so, which is why everybody should carry a journal around with them. Yeah. Everybody should, you know, have good writing habits. If you if you keep your journal next to your bed at night and you have a great idea before you fall asleep, you should write it down. You should not, you know, say to yourself, I'm going to remember that and write it down in the morning because, you know, these things vanish and then your mind will stop feeding you great ideas because they're like, God, that guy's such a slacker that, you know, I'm not even going to work for him anymore. So your unconscious mind just checks out. So you got a, you got a very nice suit on and I'm sure that has a lot of pockets. Do you have, do you have a, a particular journal that you carry around with you? Um, uh, I, I brought a little array, this, and this is my my daily array. I, because I go to the library every day and write. I, I have an office at home. I sit in it and I just weep. I can't get anything done. So, so I go to the library where I seem to have focus because as a kid that's where I went and it stayed with me all my life. So when I go, I take a bag with me. I have this small journal, which I like. It just opens up, and it's just uh, cards, note cards, like this. Can and you hold it up? So that's it. That's all size. Can you see it? Looks yeah. great. Yeah. So yeah. that just goes uh, right in my card pocket. And then I have one of these. You know these little mole skins? I love those. Uh, these are really terrific. Great size. That just slides right in your inside pocket. And then... Uh, then this is my uh, this is my daily journal. So when I open this, well, you can see it's clogged up full of all kinds of stuff naturally. But you know, so that would be how I would start. You know, a personal journal or a personal well, fire, right there. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, wow, that's those are very intricate journals and very packed. Yes, they should be. I mean, you know, you don't want your journal to be kind of breezy. <laughs> yeah, finish it. <laughs> yeah, really. And then, uh, and then I brought this one, which I thought you might like to see. So this oh, yeah. is my first journal. This is my fifth, sixth grade journal. Wow! And so, so you put all those rubber bands on it because it's so the the binding is is the binding shot. Yeah. But also, I used to keep things in it. You know, baseball cards would be in here, stamp collection would be in here, butterfly collection, all of that sort of thing. So the journal for me was like a little suitcase or a file cabinet for a kid. So rubber bands were always necessary in order to, you know, keep all your stuff. When you were when you were writing in the journal, especially as a young um, boy, were you writing stories in the journal, or were you was it more about being attuned to the world and writing down observations and little scenes, or or what what purpose did the journal serve for you? The journal for me was more observations and snippets. Um, I really didn't at 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 that. I, I really wasn't sophisticated enough or, or, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't say educated, but, but I would say I had enough experience yet to understand how everything worked in concert 
you would get these great ideas or you get a little snippet of dialogue or you'd, you'd write a couple lines you go oh that's the greatest descriptive writing i've ever done where does it fit who knows and and uh, so there was no sense of uh, a continuous narrative or how to piece it together so it was it was mostly just the capture of details where you knew they were good you just didn't exactly know what to do with them and you know i mean later on when you you know when you go I don't know, when well, you go to the beach and you collect beach glass, and each one is a beautiful little piece, but you don't know the vessel where it came from. And, and that's much how I felt. Later on, then I began to become a little bit more sophisticated and to, to connect the tissue of those pieces. And much, I would have to say, I still work much the same way. Some people think that I start with an outline. I do not start with an outline. I just start with lily pads of ideas, and I just keep throwing another one out, another one out, day after day. Just write a scene, just write something that you think the character might do, even though it may not fit you know, the, the narrative that you have in mind. You think, well, I'll just go with the flow, I'll write that. And you have a scene here, a scene there, a scene there. And you know what you have to trust? You have to trust that ultimately, once you get enough of these, that they begin to drift together, you know? And they begin to find where they fit. And then you can really understand how to piece, cut, snip, paste, you know, and, and work it all. And I prefer that than overthinking the outline. Because I'm not working on a detective novel. You know, I mean, that's not my genre. So, so I, I don't have to worry so much about the plot points at this point. I'm just really worried about setting up the beautiful texture of the book itself and the inner life of the character. Once I get that character and that world and the kind of language, the certain cant to the sentences or the rhythm of the sentences, the length and how much, how much poetic information the sentences are going to, to carry, you know, like how many adjectives or how many wonderful similes or that sort of thing, metaphors. And then once I get that and get a general feel, then, I go, okay, what is this book going to do? <laughs> and then you get down to the business of giving it some purpose. Yeah. But without finding the beauty, oh, go ahead. Without finding the beauty of the project I, or the soul of it, I don't really get motivated to write the book. I love this because uh, this is exactly my process, and I often question it. I think sometimes that I should outline more. Um, but I love the building of a narrative through all these snippets and and observations and letting it kind of percolate. And you, you articulated that so beautifully. Um, you know, we're going to move on to have you do a presentation after just your presentation after just one more question. Um, I wanted to ask this. This comes from uh, Samuel Helm from Lee Middle School in San Angelo, Texas. Okay. And and it's interesting because like you were talking about, I think I think it takes a lot of confidence to like. To, to write that and to feel like you can build a story out of all those little snippets. So the question is, what made you confident enough to write? Were you encouraged by others or did you have good ideas that you needed to express through your work? Did anyone influence you um, along the way when, when you were young or even older to, to give you the confidence to write? That's uh, it's a, it's a great question. And it's a question I think a lot of people want to ask and want to know the answer to because we all want that, that eureka moment or that moment of, of great confidence, that moment when you know, the great teacher came up to you and said, you know what, you've got it. You know, just keep pushing, you've got it. So um, I didn't have that moment. So um, not right away. Uh, I was in 10th grade. It was all the way into, until 10th grade. That, uh, I, and I was such a sloppy writer. And I, I was really, I was a, a pretty lousy student. I was gone to 10 schools in 12 grades. So my, you know, my relationship with school was not exactly ideal. So, so at any rate, so I knocked off this essay and Mrs. Jordan stood up in front of the class, the English class, and went, class, Jack has written the best essay in this class. I nearly fell out of my desk. I was like, me, who, what? You know, did I even write one? Did I turn in a paper? And so I had, and I don't know, she saw something in me, and I'm telling the story, which means that there was such a little pivot point for me, just that little bit of Jack wrote the best essay. And I thought, my God, 
that's so wonderful. I wrote the best essay. And here I was keeping my diary, reading books, having my little snippets. And then that just provided that little extra special sauce, that little ingredient to motivate me a little more. Then later on, a couple years later, I had a Latin teacher, Mr. Adelino. And Mr. Adelino saw that I was interested in literature. And uh, he took me under his wing. So by the time I graduated high school, I had a couple really good teachers that at least saw it. It wasn't a writing teacher. It was just a teacher that, that thought, he loves books. He keeps a journal. Maybe that's something special for him. Let's support it, which I'm grateful they did. That's so wonderful. I always hope everybody needs that person in their life to encourage them, I think, on some level. And, and we hope that, that Nana Rimel provides that encouragement and empowerment as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you. You, you have a, a presentation, I know, that you want to give, and we're going to try yeah. a, a new it's gonna be a little power. It's going to be a little PowerPoint, so you'll, you'll hear me. But I just want to get, um, I just want to take you into a few things and, and show you some of the stuff, particularly some of the writing radar stuff. But I want to start really by just talking about, about reading and types of books. I mean, you, your audience is thinking of a. Let's make room for types of books, you know, that we go forward with. Anyway, this is just the cover of Writing Radar. Ah, here I am in first grade. So I didn't even know how to read when I went to first grade. I was living in western Pennsylvania, and I'm, I'm sure I was digging a hole in my grandmother's backyard when somebody said, hey, why don't you go to first grade? And I was like, oh, sure. So I probably washed my hands and went down. Anyway, I learned how to read in first grade. I was a very, very slow reader. I was in the Bluebird group and the bluebird group was the slow readers but mrs niederheiser was nice enough not to call you a slow reader at any rate one of the things that happened to me about being a slow reader is that the books really stuck with me i was so slow i was i consumed the book and i could remember the book and i've always been so proud to be a slow reader so if anyone thinks that they're a slow reader out there and that you have to be a really super fast reader a great reader in order to be a writer forget that concept what you have to be is a thorough reader and you have to let a book get into you move you grow in you and sort of seize control of you for a while at any rate i read a lot of picture books now we all know great picture books, you know, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me, red bird, red bird, you know, the very hungry caterpillar, you know, corduroy, the snowy day, you know, all the George and Martha books that Miss Nelson is missing. You know, we, we you know, there, there are hundreds of thousands of great picture books. I read picture books as a child, naturally. What I did as a child influenced me later on as a writer. I never look at any book as a book that is disposable. Even though I outgrew picture books, I never lost the value of picture books. So this is Rotten Ralph, the first book I published. I went to college, I went to Emerson College in Boston. I wrote this book my sophomore year in college. And I worked with Nicole Rubel, the illustrator, and we took it to Houghton Mifflin and they bought it. A lot of people think, wow, that was so easy. What they don't know is that's the 13th full book i would written. And that was the one that was published. So if you love those books, those children's books, stick with them. And there I am at four years old. So at four years old, I was really interested in short stories. So all the Jack Henry books that I have, these are all based on my journals as a kid and all the short stories, particularly family short stories that I gathered up. These are books of short stories, and yet they still read like a novel. And many of you will be thinking about novels which have an overarching theme, but within the, the time of the theme, within that space, there'll be a lot of drop-down stories in there. And so you might kind of consider that as a form, too. Oh, Joey Pigs has swallowed the key. This book is about 160 pages long, and it's really a voice book. So when this book opens up, I mean, it is just like a, a shotgun going off. And it is that kid's voice and that kid's point of view. And he, this voice, runs the book. 
So one of the things I think a lot of writers are really good at is getting that character, getting that voice, and then just pushing it, using your character to be the pure voice of the book. So everything happens just kind of funnels right into the heart and soul of that character. And so voice is really your friend in a good book. I got a little older, that's me, about fifth, sixth grade. And then, um, oh, and that's my hometown, uh, Norvelt. Uh, this was the Newberry Award winner that year. So I, I wrote about my hometown growing up. It was a, it was a, a town started by Eleanor Roosevelt during 1934. I'm not that old, but that's where I'm from. And so I was writing about the history of that town. And so one of the things I will say is that historic texturing in a book is really a great way to set your book and also have your characters think about you know, the surrounding environment in which they live. So history is really something you want to know, and it adds significant detailing. And so keep an eye on, on moments where you can add a little bit of extra detailed information. Here I was getting just a little bit older. You can see I'm looking a little bit smarmier too. And then, and then I started moving into to novels. Now, now this novel, Desire Lines, when I was in 10th grade, there were uh, two girls, they were, they were in love with each other, but this was Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1966, and that sort of activity, that sort of love and passion between two girls was not accepted, and, and they were really hounded in our school, and at, at any rate, it ended up in a murder-suicide, which was just so tragic and so sad, and I knew one of the girls, and it was a heartbreaking event. Well, I couldn't really adequately write the book when I was in 10th grade. I didn't really have the tools for it. But I will say that that event stayed in my heart until years later, uh, the tools caught up with the motivation. And then The Love Curse of the Rumbaws. This is uh, kind of a, a book that's part history and part fiction. So my relatives are the Rumbaugh's, and they were involved with the American eugenics movement, which, again, another aspect of history that you can look into. But anyway, it was a very caustic period of, uh, well, racism, sexism, every ism was the, was the eugenics, unless you were white male. And then, uh, and so I'm writing about that uh, American eugenics movement and, and how caustic it was. And, and then there's also a personal story that gets involved there, too, with some of my relatives. And then later on, so now here I am in high school, and um, a lot of people find that making really bad choices in their life leads to a really good book. So for those of you, you know, who like trouble, um, see, it could lead to a mugshot. So this is uh, my mugshot from uh, right after I graduated high school. I was uh, involved with some illicit activities, mostly smuggling drugs, but I got over it. Don't worry, I'm, I'm fine. Work with children all the time. Um, so it led to this memoir. And this is really the point, is that many of you out there have a compelling personal story and you're driven to write this compelling personal story. The very first thing you should do, and, and I mean today, is, is go down to the library or go down to a bookstore or, or your shelves at home and really get some great personal memoirs and, and start reading them. That first person point of view, the feeling, the depth, the activity, and how that book unfolds. Because there's a story inside of you, and I'm sure many of you have a personal story inside of you that you want to share. Reading good memoirs gives you the strength, the courage, and the support to do it, and also really a lot of tips. So I would encourage you to go in that direction. I write a lot of different books, and I like writing a lot of different books. So writing radar. Let's go to the essential stuff. Now, this book is using your journal to snoop out and craft great stories. And this is really the, the, the point in which I entered the world of writing with that journal. So this is what my journal always looked like. 
for me. I would open a journal and I would stare at a blank page. It would stare at me. I'd stare at it. It would stare at me. And really, it would just look at me like loser. I dare you to improve on the blank page. I doubt if you could do it. And I would stare at the page for as long as I possibly could. It was like sticking my finger in the electric socket, you know, until finally I just blew myself away. And I felt so humiliated by my own lack of doing anything, I would close the book, try again the next day, close the book, try again the next day. It was a little defeating, but I did have a lot of, you know, capacity for self-abuse. At any rate, I was working at the school library and I was shelving books and I shelved Harriet the Spy. And you could see that Harriet has a little journal in her hand. And I, it just caught my eye and I thought, I wonder what Harriet's doing with her journal because obviously I'm doing nothing with mine. And so I read this book and it was like a huge eureka moment. It was like, oh my God, all Harriet is doing is you know, walking through her neighborhood, spying on everybody, overhearing everyone's conversations, and then writing them down in, in her journal. And I thought, that's a brilliant idea. Why didn't somebody tell me that being a snoop, which I was, was the first step to being a writer? So I went out side. Oh, first, I went to the library and I did this silly thing, which kind of shocked even me. Um, I went to the, the G cell shelf in the library where Gantos would be, but it wasn't yet. And uh, it was right between Galdone and George. And I stuck my hand on that shelf right there. And I had this little oath and I said, someday I'm going to write a book and it's going to go here. And then that so freaked me out. I just turned and ran to, out of the library. But I had already said it, so I was going to make it true. Anyway, took my journal. There it is. And then poof my first spy map. So this is what I want you to do. First, you get a journal, right? Get a nice journal. You know, well, something might be a little nicer than this. It doesn't have to be terribly fancy, but something like this, opening, oh, that, you know, sort of fits in your pocket or, you know, is sizable enough to carry around. And then get a big sheet of paper. And I want you to like walk around your block. This is what I did at any rate. And so this is Fort Lauderdale, Florida. That's the Gantos family house down below there. And that's my dog in the backyard. It was eaten by an alligator. So, you know, that was something to write about. And then uh, that big spot on the wall, that's where I threw up on the wall. So I put that there. And then that's um, another dog of mine. That's why that tombstone is there. That's, see that bicycle? My dad ran that over. And then next door is the Pagoda family. There's a target on the roof because Mr. Pagoda painted an atomic bomb target on his roof during the Cuban Missile crisis and would stand on his roof and go, come on, Mr. Castro, if you're any man at all, wing one of those nuclear tip missiles at me, ha! Huh? And, you know, he would dare him up there. My dad was like, he's a nut. I'm like, whoa, he's a great nut. And then, you know, uh, that's where I broke my brother's arm playing Barnum and Bailey Circus Dare. And then that's the swimming pool. We used to ride our bikes off the roof into the pool. Don't tell anyone. And then Mr. Bellucci built a boat. It sank in about 15 minutes. Not good. We had an airplane crash in our neighborhood. So you kind of get the idea that, that what I was after was proof that I had something to write about. The blank page wasn't enough. I needed proof. And so I went out. I drew this neighborhood map. And it was just as they say, seeing is believing. And when it developed on the page, I was like, and that's me, that's my brother, my sister, Betsy, all my neighbors, and that got me started. Now, many of us don't know our neighbors, so here's a good place to start, your house. So this is the action map of your house. So what I want you to do is get a big sheet of paper and draw your house, and I want you to slowly snoop from room to room and think, action, action, what interesting thing happened in this room or this room or this room or this room? And I want you to start putting, putting it in. You know, this is the kitchen. You know, my sister set the house on fire. This is the bathroom. I never took a shower. I would just sit in there and read a book. Uh, that's my bedroom. That's where I pulled a wart off the bottom of my foot and it just bled all over the wall. That was trouble. That's my sister's room. I was never allowed there. That's Zippy the roach. I dropped a roach in my sister's sleeping mouth. That was really good. Jack Stan, that's where I threw up on the wall, exploding hot dogs. So, so suddenly, as a kid, what I needed was the confidence that I could see it and then would write about it. So do this. 
Now, do not do do not do what some students do, and and that is do the minimal map. You know, they they draw a square, they draw a line, they draw a piece of distressed broccoli that's supposed to be a tree and a stick figure, and and they go, that's my life. Don't do that. I want you to do the Uber map. I want you to get every big little minuscule detail on there. Then I want you to make two lists. I want you to make a list of action words. And I definitely want you to make a list of good, powerful, emotional words. Words that really speak to the interior of the character's life. So here we have action, here we have interior life. Some people start a story by being really inspired by the emotions. Some people start a story by being inspired by the action. You don't know yet which one is going to inspire you, so pay attention to both sides, interior, exterior. Then take that same map, and now where you had every action, I want you to then have an emotional word attached to that action. Therefore, you would have the two principal elements, right? You'd have action, and you'd have emotion, and you have characters, you have a setting, and suddenly you've got some of the major texture, the stuff to get started writing. And that stuff, it has just enough momentum to give you confidence and to let you see into the story where to go next. So, where do you go next? Well, here's what I'd like to do. Now, I know you're trying to write novels, and so you really have to gear up for it. But when I was uh, young and when I talked to young students, I would try and just set a clock, like 10 minutes a day when I was younger. And so all I would do is write for 10 minutes a day in my journal. And then after I had a big mashup of it, I would then try and organize it. So from beginning, middle, and end, which all of us know, beginning, middle, and end. But in the beginning, you have character setting problem, which is pretty you know, obvious. And then the middle, the middle I always find is about half of the book. And that's that rising action leading up to some sort of crisis or moment, and then a resolution where you solve that problem. And then you always have that double ending because of that texture. Remember, you have the physical world and the emotional world. Then for an ending, you need a physical ending and an emotional ending. And you especially need the emotional ending because that always, always reflects back on the characters. And that becomes part of the theme. How has the character been changed through the action? How has the needle changed on that interior life of the character? So that emotionally, they've seen something new, felt something new. That's really where a good novel burrows into the reader. Finally, just some focused rewrites. So I do about 100 drafts per, per novel. Now, not everybody is, is that way. I'm just, you know, I'm sort of possessed with it. But, but certainly the things that you would want to pay attention to would be the point of view, you know, the voice of the narrator. I write a lot of my novels in the first person point of view. If you're writing a memoir, you certainly would. And then structure, you would apply all the elements. Physical draft, you want... You want to read your story on the surface, make sure that all of it is, is perfectly clear. You want to drop down, reread it, make sure that for every action, there might be some emotional texturing that goes in there. Theme, you have to stop and say, what is the theme of this story? What am I building up to? Dialogue, make your character speak. Nothing brings a character alive faster than really good dialogue. Makes them three-dimensional. Then look at your descriptions and write words. Then I want you to review everything. And then I want you to just rake out all the useless words, all those extra ands, if, buts, so's, you know, and that word like, which always gets in there 10,000 times. And, and then poof, something good is going to happen. So, in Writing Radar, we're just looking really at getting started and then going from getting started to sort of looking at all the major elements of writing, the basic core elements of writing, so that point by point, page by page, step by step, you really get the whole process. It's not going to write your book for you, but what it will do is make you very articulate as a result. So you will be asking yourself critical questions of your own writing and looking for very articulate answers to those questions. And then you become a very good uh, writer so that you need 
to ask the question and then you get the answer. You can be self-directed and that's really important. Finally, just a picture of some journals. So that's the end of the PowerPoint. Perhaps I've gone on a touch too long, but I just wanted to give you the, the basics of what I do and what I think are really step-by-step -step points for you. That was one. That was one, Jack. Jack, um, I can't look I can't at your journals enough. They're they're pieces of art to me. I love I love the the enormity of them and the how how many things go in them. I guess it seems they they, they just seem like a, a well of ideas rather than a neat little you know record of your life. Well, uh, yeah. So like if like if I hold that up, right? You know, there's. I mean, that really does look like a club sandwich. And so so. Um, what would be that with the early ones i was i was blessed with one of those neat and tidy moms many of us are and uh and and so like if i left baseball cards sitting around on my desk in my room they would disappear my stamps would disappear you know my my bug collection would disappear so that's what this is for this is the journal file cabinet for all that stuff <laughs> well wonderful um that's that's, that's that's well such a great presentation. I've never done a story map of my home, the home I grew up in, or the home I live in now. But this is going to be a new. I'm going to do that exercise today to see if I get any new ideas for a novel this month. Oh, uh, that's great. Yeah, we've got a bunch of questions. I'll ask some of them that we crowdsourced, but feel free to put them in the chat, and Catherine will send them to me to uh, give to you. This question comes from Laura from South Wales. Uh, she says, asks, is it important to know your ending before you start to write your story? Do you have a sense of your ending or do you actually know it, Jack, before you start? Mm, not, not really. I'd rather, uh, I'd rather start knowing my character than knowing the ending. Um, I don't really need that much of a roadmap. And, and one thing that I find that any time I've ever established what the ending is, I've always struggled to meet it. I've always had to make compromises along the way in order to satisfy that structured ending. So I don't want to be, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be beholden to an ending that really I'm just plucking out of thin air. I'd rather uh, be companionate with the character and the situation. Mm -hmm. That's great because you can find it. We, we, have, a, we have a book called, uh, our founder, Chris Beatty, wrote a book called No Plot, No Problem, mm -hmm. uh, meaning, meaning that you find the plot, you find the ending in the, in the process of writing. Yes, I think you do. Yeah. So this next question, though, I mean, plot is a, is a key part of, of why we read, what makes it fun, entertaining, and meaningful. Uh, and let me see, this, this comes from Andy at Lee Middle School in Texas, he asks, he or she asks, how do you come up with your plot and keep it interesting? How do you keep it interesting if, if, if you're kind of writing for that process of discovery? Oh, that's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question. How do you keep any novel interesting? Um, certain things have to be refreshed. Um, moving your character from place to place, um, having uh, introducing actions and other characters um, and having a, a, a rich interior life and then of course uh, the the absolute brilliant refreshment that dialogue brings brings to a to a book so so that you know when you're thinking of you know how you're moving that book along how, how you're building that book you're really multitasking with uh, a lot of of key, elements of, of writing and so what you're doing is you're just kind of rotating them in and out and and making sure that you that you're not just staying in uh, one thick you know uh, paragraph that is just all uh, sort of exposition and you're telling the reader everything I think the reader gets a little tired of that they want to break away they want to you, to break the ligature between the character and the writer. They want to go with the character and they don't care really that much about you, the writer. 
So don't put all the information in. Hold some stuff back. Hold some stuff back and measure it. Yeah. yeah. This next question, um, this is more about the the kind of stamina I think it takes to finish, whether it's a rough draft or, or, or a novel through revision. Uh, but Joe from Harry Stone Montessori Academy in Dallas, he asks, have you ever begun writing a story and lost motivation to finish it? Um, and, and maybe you can touch a little bit on just those, those you know, every writer has those moments of, of self-doubt or, or questioning the, the novel and, and perhaps wanting to flee from it. How do, how do you get your motivation back to finish it or, or how you abandon projects? Oh, that's such a, that's such an awful question because it just has a thousand different answers. Um, I caution people all the time not to give up because people can train themselves to give up. So let's say you start a story and you get a part way down and then you go, oh, okay, I got my characters threw in a little dialogue, got a little bit of, you know, background information. Here's one or two actions, but what the heck? I don't know where this is going. Oh, let me start another story. Let me start another story. And before long, you're great at starting stories, but you're not a finisher. And there are so many people out there that aren't finishers. There's so many people out there that aren't, that real writers that do finish talk about people as non-finishers. So you don't want to be that person. What you want to do is make sure that when you're writing your story, that you try and get that momentum, that daily, daily momentum, even if it's just a little bit, add something to it. Imagine something to it. Add in idiosyncratic material to it that you don't even think belongs in it that throw it in there because it might generate some new thinking, some fresh thinking. And then of course, it never hurts to have a really good writing partner where you can show them some material and get some feedback from somebody that reads it who goes, have you considered this? Have you thought about this? Could you expand this? Could you build this out? And you know, some of those kinds of thinking moments really do generate, uh, you know, new enthusiasm and new thoughts and, and keep you going. Only, only, only after I have whipped myself with every miserable question and if, uh, that I would abandon something. And I can, I can count on one hand that any project I've abandoned. And I published 50 books and, and I don't like to abandon. No, no, don't, don't do that, no. <laughs> I, I love that. I think uh, one of the premises of NaNoWriMo and one of the things I hope it teaches people is that 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 rough draft is in large way a creative experiment so i loved how you said to to just keep going and add things just for the sake of adding them because uh i think i think just by by keeping the focus on progress uh you're opening yourself up to taking creative risks and sometimes those creative risks are what make the novel really special um i liked also what you said about having a friend uh to to help you in those moments to brainstorm um through tough parts and uh, Braden Thorson from uh, Lee Middle School in Texas. We had a lot of questions from Lee Middle School. Uh, asks, what other authors are your friends and how have they inspired you to write better? And the reason I think this question is important is that uh, so many writers uh, view themselves as entirely solitary writers. And, and NaNoWriMo is as much about this uh, challenge to write a, a novel in a month as it is about the community that's going to support you along the way. So how has your, your, your writing community um, influenced you? That's a pretty good question. So let, me, let me just give you a quick piece of background. So I get up in the morning. I feed the cats. I make the coffee. I deliver the coffee to my wife. And then I go to the gym. When I'm at the gym, I go on the bike. I'm on the bike for a half an hour. I take one of those journals with me. I take this journal with me. All this writing is bicycle writing, okay? I collect thoughts. I go home, I take a hot shower, as hot as a human can. And then I walk to the library. I go into the library, the Boston Athenaeum. It's a quiet library, no talking. So there goes the community. And then, so I go up, I climb 140 steps to the fifth floor. We call it the scriptorium. You go up there, I sit down. I have my computer, I have all my notebooks. I write all my books out by hand first. So then I do two hours of first draft writing, two hours of second draft writing, two hours of reading right in the middle of the day when my brain is still sticky enough to remember what I'm reading. And then I do about three or four more hours of rewriting and I go home. Next day I do it again. Next day I do it again. Next day I do it again. 
I do not send any of that material to my editor. I do not send it to my agent. I do not welcome that. I do not want anybody bothering me at that point. I am just trying to throw myself as actively as possible at this book. Once I get the book at that point, that's when I invite the community in. I need to know that I have discovered enough of it myself so that I know that when I'm getting feedback, I know which parts that I've written are essential core parts of the soul of the book. And which parts, you know what, might be weak. And somebody's pointing out these really soft tissue parts that need to be flicked out of the book. So that's what I share. Now, when I was younger, you know, I, I shared a little bit, but I was a very self-conscious writer. I was at a school today, PS 70, PS 158 in New York City. And those students, fourth graders, fifth graders, they were all sharing their writing. They all knew all the terms of writing. And there they were, sitting around tables, reading their work, and everybody was asking articulate questions and helping them build it and pull it apart and, and, and make it more magnificent. I have to tell you, I was a little jealous. But I'm stuck in my rut. I'm climbing the steps. I'm going up to the library. That's me. Great. Um, I love the way you go to the library to keep out distractions. I think distractions are a real challenge for writers these days, especially with the internet. I know it's changed my writing process. Do yeah. you have access to the internet at all while you're writing? Or are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. You have it if you want it. <laughs> you have to Good. turn the cell phone off. I turn the cell phone off. You know, people, the, on average, and I think this is a, an understated number, look at their cell phone at least 80 times a day. Okay, and that's, and I think, I look around, people are looking on their phone. They're on their phone. I'm like, you're up here to write. This is the scriptorium. Get out a pen and a piece of paper and get busy. You know, the cell phone is not going to be your friend. So you've got to train yourself to stay in that tunnel, to stay on that page, and really set a goal and complete it. Otherwise, you train yourself to be distracted easily. And I know this, when I'm between novels, when I finish a novel, my focus is so keen. And then if I take a month off, oh, does it get flabby, flabby focus, I can't tell you. And then when I start this novel going this way, I can't stand myself because I've let myself go. Really, I have. Yeah. So I have to build up that focus muscle. It's true. You have to train it. Yeah. It does get flabby fast. Yeah. Um, one, one question from uh, one of our viewers, Rachel. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I, I'm going to give it a shot. Kaladzi. Uh, she asks, what one thing have you learned that you wish you knew when you started? Huh. You know what I wish I'd learned, which is funny to me now, is I never thought I had a sense of humor in my writing. And, and so I, I stayed away from, from being humorous altogether. Anytime I wrote a humorous line, I looked at that and I was like, that's a third rate line. That's just humor. And then um, I would kick it out. And uh, for years, I was that way. For, and, and the other thing I thought, I had terrible dialogue. You know, I thought, oh, God, you can't write dialogue forever. So I had no humor and no dialogue. I mean, my, my, the, the writing, essentially, the manuscript would look like a, a cement brick. That's basically what it would resemble. It had no pulse to it whatsoever. So I think sometimes um, you shouldn't be so harsh on yourself, and you should allow yourself to develop. But that was a blind spot that I had for many years. Uh, this question comes from, let's see, Ramani Swarnal, and she asks, is it necessary to take a course on writing before starting to write a short story or novel? Did, have you taken classes or workshops, and, and if you did, what, what did you learn, or do you think you can, you can teach yourself how to write a novel or a story? Well, good question. Um, I, I did go to college for creative writing. So I have two degrees in creative writing. I got my BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts, in creative writing in uh, 1976. I got the BFA. And then I had to get uh, 
an, an MA in creative writing because I was also teaching. They, they hired me to teach right out of undergrad because I was publishing books as an undergrad. And so they, they hired me and I set up uh, a creative writing program for them. I found this, that, that when you run a great creative writing program and, and, and you're giving students a very critical language to use for themselves and you're having a fair and supportive group of students in that room, helping each other, asking questions, building up egos and building strength, that it is a positive experience, a very positive experience. And I think a, I think a great writing workshop is something many people should consider. Great. Well, fortunately, we have a lot of people in writing workshops of sorts right now with our Young Writers Program. A lot of them, a lot of the students and teachers are watching this. Um, I'm taking some questions here that we, we crowdsourced earlier. Uh, a lot of people want to write series these days. I think there are more series on the bookshelves than there were when I was growing up, at least. Yes. Uh, Chastity uh, asks, what was it like writing a series? And she is coming from Louisa, Virginia. Does uh, your writing series change your writing? Uh, does, does a series change the writing? Yeah, what was it like? Well, you know, it was an unintentional series. So I wrote the first Joey Pigs a book, and uh, that just, uh, it initiated a second one. And that initiated a third one, initiated a fourth one, and then finally the themes from all of those books began to cascade one upon one, and then finally that fifth book then satisfied all of those themes together. So I found that to be a very natural uh, approach to it. I mean, it was a little bit unexpected, but in order to satisfy the themes of what happened to Joey and, and, and what was his world like, um, I, I brought that to a closure after five books. I think some people head out, you know, to, to do a whole, a whole series. I would probably say like Dan Handler with, you know, the Lemony Snicket books. He was thinking theme, right, or rather series, right from the, you know, the get-go. And a lot of people start off that way, and if they can manage it, that's terrific. You know, J.K. Rowling, I mean, look at that. I mean, you know, she owns England now. And so I think that's pretty good. I, I think Lemony Snicket owns San Francisco. So, so those who can do a popular series, that's great. But I would say probably for every popular series that makes it, there must be thousands that are, you know, just run up on the shoals because they're just, well, they're just copycats. So Thank make you. make sure your work is original if you do it. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning Lemony Snicket. He's actually a friend of NaNoWriMo's. He, uh, he wrote a great pep talk for us uh, several years ago. Oh, uh, this is a question time. from Angelina San in Central Middle School uh, in Prairieville, Louisiana. And she wants to know, how do we make our characters seem unique and easy to visualize? I think part of the reasons we fall in love with our favorite books, or maybe the main reason is we, we are so intrigued and, and connect so much with the character. Even if we, we hate the main character, there's something bonding us with him or her. How do you make your characters uh, unique and easy to visualize and likable or unlikable maybe? Hmm, good question. Um, I try not to overburden the reader right from the get-go with every little detail about the character and the character's life. I also try and make sure that I have uh, a lot of dialogue for that character, because what I want to do when building a character, particularly in the beginning of a book, is to shift the reader's focus from my narrative voice to the character's voice. And dialogue is the way you do that. It just pivots the book around so that the character is telling the story rather than the narrator, you know, sort of pushing the story onto the reader. And in doing that, then the character comes alive, the character is giving snippets of themselves, and the character is revealing, you know, what seems to be the truth about themselves rather than the narrator. And so the character becomes the reliable one at this at that juncture. And I and I find that what happens is that a lot of people try and load up the bus, you know, with all the character information in the first like chapter, and then they, you know, sort of unspool it, you know, later on throughout the novel. But I, I don't do that at all. And I think it's really wonderful. It's a great way to open a new chapter. 
by by almost saying um, you wouldn't necessarily say this, but you would but you would be thinking that now I'm going to introduce a new feature to that character, something you didn't know, and you know that just refreshes that character right away, mm -hmm. and that could be chapter ten, you know. So so don't give it all away too early. I like how you focus on the essential truth that the character is revealing. I, I, I feel like that, it's, it's hard to describe what that truth is for every character, but I do feel like that's how we, we connect with the story. We're after that, that truth that, that, that's somehow out there. You know, it's almost like the X-Files, the truth is out there in every book. I think so too. You know, there's a rule of thumb that says a reader will, will read a book with a great character, but a lousy plot. But they really will give up on a book that has a good plot but a lousy character. You know, the, the character really counts in a book. And that, that becomes really one of the first things you want to be able to do well. Well, I think we have time for two more questions. Okay. Um, this one comes from Kel Wilson. How do you write differently for different age groups? I think there are very few authors in the world who have written for so in so many different uh, genres, Jack. And uh, mm. I think sometimes we get too trapped in in our preferred genre, our preferred you know niche. Uh, but mm -hmm. you've written a true spectrum of books. How do you how do you juggle the different decisions of of language and narrative? It's a it's a good question. I think, and it, for me, it happens pretty organically. Um, you know, when I when I sit down to write to write a book, I'm not asking myself about the age group. I'm I'm asking myself about the idea. What is the idea of this book? And and you know, what is the theme? And where am I going? Sort of with, with this. And then once I start writing that book, then I begin to see. Oh yeah, this is you know this is like fifth, sixth, seventh grade. This is you know the theme, the character, the idea, the humor. It's all sort of going in that direction. But I, but I like to let the material begin to find itself. Some things you know right off. When I was writing Hall of My Life, and that's a memoir, you know, it's a, you know, sort of a prison memoir. Um, well, you know that what kind of audience that's for. That was for, you know, a, a YA, an adult, an adult audience. And when you're writing a picture book, you know, you pretty much know that that's going to be a, for a four to eight year old audience, you know, with a rotten off picture book or something other type of picture book. So you have a general sense to begin with, and I would just say it's pure common sense. There's nothing that tricky about it. Great. Well, this is our final question. Uh, unfortunately, our hour is almost up. This has been so wonderful to hear, hear your tips. Uh, but but what, what advice would you give to writers this month in November? They're, they're setting out sometimes to write their, their first novel. Some people have written as many as 10 or 15 with us, though. Um, but but think about especially maybe the, the the people writing their first or second novel. When you're sitting down to write uh, a, a story of such enormity and and to write essentially every day for the month of November, if you're going to hit your word count or almost every or most days, uh, what would you tell our young writers? I would I would tell them this. I, I would tell them that it, that it has to be something that you really sort of fear doing but love doing simultaneously. So it's always going to have a lot of tension to it because it's got the fear love thing going on there. And then you got the love hate thing going on there. And, and you're, so you're playing like a psychological game with yourself while you're also trying to create art. Remember you're creating art, you know? So, so when you run into a tough time, just turn the page and just start writing some dialogue, write some narrative, write, write what, write off task but just keep the words coming. And, and also remember this, that, that you're thinking, oh my gosh, I have to get this done in a month, right? I should know the plot in advance. Not every book needs a plot. You know, some books are so beautiful, so great. Think of the great French writer, Ponget. Ponget never had a plot. He just wrote something beautiful. I read his books all the time. They're just so enlightening. You know, so, so I think that when you look at the range of literature out there, you're going to find that it's not all plot. You're going to find, though, that everybody loves beauty. Everybody loves the interior life. Everybody loves to be moved. And the poetic nature of a good book inside your life is what you want to give to any reader. And they'll love you for it. Wow. 
That was great, Jack, especially for a, a, a plot challenge person like like me. Um, yeah. But but I think it's like the, the two pieces I take from that is one, it's it right for the beauty, you know. I love the way you express that, right for the poetry within you, and don't get too hung up on on that sort of like uh, pacing plot idea, and, and and also like turn the page, yeah. keep going, and even if you, we always say, you know. Uh, Sometimes people, when they get behind on their word count in NaNoWriMo, they stop writing. They just give up. Mm. Uh, they're not going to hit their 50,000 words. But but I'm always like, no, keep going. I mean, e even if you don't hit 50,000 words, the premise of the month is to really make creativity and writing a priority. And we want everyone to tell their story. And the best way to do that is to keep turning the page, as you put it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I, r I really do believe that. And, and, and whether you get the 50,000, or whether you get 25 beautiful, 25,000 beautiful words, you've won. Exactly. Yeah, writing a novel is a gift. It's a gift to yourself. It's a gift to the world. And thank you so much, Jack. This was really inspiring. I, I know uh, our, the people who viewed this are going to leave this with uh, new, new, new ways to think of their own ra writing radar and new ways to think about getting those words on the page. So we really appreciate it. And I hope people will check out Jack's book, Writing Radar. It's, it's super fun. And, and as you saw, he's a, he's, a, he's a really wise writer. So uh, I, I look forward to, to carrying this out in November. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And all of you out there, I'm really in your corner. I believe you can do it. So just go out there and knock it out of the park. Thank you very much. Take all care. Right. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. I'm on my way to write a map of my childhood home. I hope you are, too. Yes, Bye -bye. I am. Thanks for joining us. Take care.